The Cambridge Soundworks 2.1 Digital versus the Alltech Lansing ACS56. Both speaker sets are long gone in terms of being contemporary and still available to not buy secondhand, but the lessons of this original sloppy speaker showdown from back in my college days can still teach us things about computer speakers today. This is Multimedia J Radio Style for Monday, November 18th, 2019. Let's start the show. Warning. Multimedia J Radio Style contains controversial content, strongly voiced opinions, and uncensored bluntness. Listener discretion is advised. <laughs> Well, folks, here come the dislikes, as predicted. Once again, people just cannot come to grips with the hard reality that I am tearing down the golden calf of computer speakers. But what can I say? When you've been burned by what used to be a walled garden, that basically was what computer sound was in the days when I was getting introduced to it, and you feel like you, you wish you could have done what you're doing now years and years ago, you don't stay silent. You stand up for yourself, you take a stand, and you say stuff that may very well be unpopular and get a lot of people upset at you. But when these people, if they ever do, that is, when these people finally figure out that you're right, they start to respect you and they're like, I see where you're coming from now. Hopefully, someday that happens. In the meantime, let's reminisce on what is essentially the original Sloppy Speaker Showdown. <laughs> So, today's souped-up image for this podcast is basically a PowerPoint slide hammed up to hack with pictures of two speaker systems, the Cambridge Soundworks 2.1 Digital and the Alltech Lansing ACS56, both speaker systems that totally got you thinking you had good sound in a Dunning-Kruger effect kind of way back when I was in college and both systems with gimmicks, and both systems that I would absolutely lampoon nowadays as complete hog crap. Because, oh man, the Dunning-Kruger effect, when you think you're better at something than you actually are, was pretty strong back when I was in college. So a quick rundown of what we're looking at here. Both systems featured 3-inch non-woofers <laughs> for the mid-range and highs. So this, they're different shaped boxes with different badges on them and stuff. And on the, in the so-called subwoofer category, which I consider neither of these to be subwoofers, because once you hear the speaker size, you'll realize you can get bookshelf speakers with these things as mid-ranges nowadays. The Cambridge Soundworks poof box on the left had a five and a quarter woofer inside a poof box. <laughs> I have that for my mid-range nowadays with the woofers in my bookshelf speakers. Uh, hey, naive college kid in a small dorm room. Yeah. Oh, this was bass. <laughs> the Alltech Lansing ACS 56 had six and a half. Again, you can buy cheap Dayton audio bookshelf speakers with six and a half woofers in them that are not meant to be used as a subwoofer, but hey, it's a subwoofer because it's way deeper than the crappy three inches doing all the other frequencies. <sighs> and the reason why I'm saying sloppy speaker showdown is because this was a sloppy speaker showdown back in my college days. I had the Altex and my roommate at the time who was totally bamboozled by the whole digital speakers marketing gimmick had the Cambridge ones on the left. And let me tell you, I believe I mentioned before when I bought two pairs of these to do stereo mirroring and surround sound, an attempt, a form of surround sound with the Altex. He was like more speakers or maybe it was when I bought my original 56s because I bought the ACS 54s, the stripped down versions of those with a four, like a four inch woofer or whatever. And I realized that they weren't what I heard somebody rattle the house with the previous summer, which was the ACS 56s. 
Of course, when I got my Clips Pro Media 4.1s and actually heard what real bass sounds like instead of mid bass that only sounds bassy because you have crappy three inch speakers doing everything else, things changed. But hey, Dunning Kruger effect, like I said. The previous summer, when I was working on campus with the IT and the AV folks, we actually were housed up in the senior townhouses, so it was pretty awesome to go from freshman dorms to senior townhouses as we just got done being freshmen. But I had a housemate that summer who had a pair of ACS 56s that shook the whole house when he did the THX test. And of course, lots of people had MP3s of that back in those days. So and everything started rumbling at that spot with the really low uh, thing at the end and the high thing going at the same time. I was like, what is that? What kind of speakers are those? Because in my own Dunning-Kruger effect state, I thought that the two Polk audios that came with my computer combined with a Kmart piece of crap <laughs> special from uh, Cyber Acoustics with a so-called four-inch subwoofer stuffed in my desk drawer... <laughs> I thought that was good until this guy shook the house with a pair of 56s. So when I wound up with a roommate who was all snippety doodle about the Soundworks digital. Oh, man, that sparked a rivalry. <laughs> so to, I, I realize we're a lot smarter these days. However, I should probably mention that when you hear digital speakers, all that means is that the speakers have a DAC in them, digital to analog converter. So they will convert a digital signal into analog, which the speakers will then play. In the case of the so-called digital speakers marketing gimmick of the early knots in my college days, the reason why so-called digital speakers sounded better is because they were processing the sound outside of the computer. So everything stayed digital and it wasn't decoded until the signal was outside of the noisy environment in terms of EMI and other stuff and oscillators and all kinds of other things that computers tend to have in them. So that's the only reason why so-called digital speakers sounded better. Today, you can get the same effect just by buying an external sound card, which will have a DAC in it or a dedicated DAC box of some sort. Just get the sound outside of your computer before you decode it. And that's what you'll have a digital system. But oh man, try telling that to my roommate back in those days and you would get nowhere. Well, my speakers sound better because they're digital. And then he cranked up boy band music through them <laughs> because I think it was because his girlfriend at the time was into boy bands. So he kind of just tagged along. And so here was this dude blasting O-Town. <laughs> <laughs> nothing or all through the poof box on this thing and that hundred hertz mid bass boop 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 i'm like come on come on dude <laughs> and so after a couple of rounds of crappy early 2000s boy band music through the poof box in the sound works i started crafting very uh crafty plans for revenge by getting the speakers that the guy i had roomed with over the summer had shook the whole house with the alltech lansings and when we got these things, when we got, when I got these things, I screwed up and got the ACS 54s first. Then I just got rid of those. And then, uh, the ACS 50 or wait, no, uh, they just wound up in a closet until I got rid of them. But yeah, they were crap. So <laughs> all of this is crap. It just back then it was comparatively crap. So then I got a set of AC ACS 56s and he was, he was like, all tech sucks and they're not digital. Oh boy. Then I started blasting something with a six and a half woofer actually doing its job as opposed to a five and a quarter in a poof box with a port and things went deeper and louder. And he was like, holy stuff, except he didn't say stuff. <laughs> you all know what he said. I just want to keep things family friendly here for the guys. Whoa. And that's what, of course, his braggadocious attitude turned to envy, jealousy, and just bad-mouthing me every time I played anything at a decent volume. And then uh, when I got another set of speakers to complement these and try to go stereo mirroring or crude surround, he was like, more speakers? Of course, having a second subwoofer, quote unquote, in the back uh, wasn't really all that big of a thing. It, it never is. It never has been that big of a thing. But, uh, hey, you know, it was what you did until we started seeing more. I think the the actually, yeah, the Logitech Z560s weren't even a thing yet. So 
Klipsch versus Logitech, I only knew that Klipsch was too expensive at the time. And the only reason I ever got 4.1s is because I caught a, a B-stock sale and got them for substantially less than retail price. So that's the only reason I even had Klipsch in college to begin with, but thank goodness, because that introduced me to what, to what some real sound can sound like, as opposed to these things. Interestingly enough, I don't think I ever got this working while I was still rooming with this guy, but... I actually found a digital in, I think it was, or something. I actually got the Altex to take what I think was a digital signal. I think the sound card that I was using at the time, crappy creative PCI, whatever it was, the crappy sound card I had at the time that only did stereo actually did have a digital option. I don't know if it actually worked or not, but regardless, we now know nowadays with the ability to build a DAC amp combination for computer sound and not even need a sound card, keep it digital, send everything USB and have the external equipment decode, amplify and do everything for you. We now know nowadays that this digital gimmick was only a thing because of noisy analog sound when the DACs were inside the computer. And all of this nowadays would be complete crap because of the walled garden known as computer sound back then. And it was a walled garden. I mean, whereas real audio equipment was using things like the spring terminals on there or, you know, things like banana plugs or something like just something besides three and a half millimeter mini. It was mini plugs galore back in those days. And it was stereo unless you had a special sound card for 4.1 surround because 5.1 surround was a movie thing. You only really needed the center channel for things like movie dialogue. Games at the time were working with more quadraphonic based 4.1 surround at the time. So nowadays, of course, I run 5.1 because I don't have the I don't have the living room set up to make 7.1 really work. And I am not really sold on the whole Dolby Atmos thing. But ultimately, the lessons we can learn from this are that you are being sold a bag of goods and essentially a sound appliance when you buy computer speakers. In the case of the Altex, the sats were hardwired. So if you didn't like the sound of the sats, you would you pretty much had to splice things up yourself in order to upgrade them. And then you had to deal with the crossover setting on the amplifier and the fact that you were using a mid bassy six and a half as opposed to a minimum eight inch subwoofer that can actually do non directional frequencies without needing some kind of gimmicky box or something like that in order to pull that off. And of course, college students on a budget as well as limited space in a dorm room. These were I mean, you were using the subwoofer, if you want to call it that as your footrest in most cases, because there just wasn't the room for anything bigger. I think nowadays, though, I would probably make room for an eight inch sub. If I was doing it all over again, I would make room for an eight inch sub and a home theater system and just find a place to stash the box. Of course, folks I went to school with found a way to have a stereo in addition to their computer, which we were using tube monitors back then. So even more of a space disadvantage for us, there were some people with money to burn that had flat panels, but that's where you encountered things like ghosting and video games and other early flat panel crap. <laughs> so uh, LCDs were pretty crude back then. But in if I had to do it all over again, what I would do is I would basically have what I have now. I would just find a spot for the receiver, use the remote control, of course, and have an eight inch sub as my footrest and use home theater surrounds as my desk speakers, as opposed to bookshelves, because I'd probably have a normal monitor instead of a TV for a display. But hey, you know, I could probably squeeze in some four inch bookshelves. I mean, Micah does make four inch four inch bookshelf speakers with a decent amount of power handling. So that's the thing. A lot of this gimmick from back when I back in my college days with these two speaker systems and most of what else you could buy on the market. A lot of the, this gimmick of the computer speaker thing was because of the walled garden that computer sound was. You had to do everything through mini plugs. Things were dependent upon your sound card. Today, even onboard sound can spit something out digitally and you can decode it with a decoder box and a very small decoder box at that and upgrade the DAC if you want better sound processing later on or basically mix and match whatever gear you want. This whole walled garden sound appliance thing is a relic of the past. And that's why I look at it today with a grain of salt. So folks can get as mad at me as they want. But the truth is what it is. You know, I know that I was suckered with this whole computer speakers thing back in the day. 
And when people nowadays that have sunk some money into computer speakers realize this, yeah, you got to take your hard knocks in life and learn lessons the hard way. It's just the way life is. But once you know and you get over the rem- the buyer's remorse and whatnot, the cognitive dissonance of realizing you were wrong, that's when you can move up to something that sounds a lot better, is a lot more efficient and is a lot more upgradable as opposed to buying new versions of whatever these you want to call these things every time you want to improve anything and then having to figure out what to do with the old ones or dispose of them or stuff like that. But maybe, maybe, you know, for the sake of channels like Garrett Claridge, who destroys crappy college kid speakers for YouTube views, maybe some people, well, yeah, <laughs> nah, we got, we have to support things moving forward, not holding on to people's previous mistakes like that. So I also find it interesting as a side note, as we close this discussion here, I also find it interesting that there are Amazon Basics branded speakers that look very, very similar to certain Logitech SKUs. It makes me wonder if Amazon struck a deal with Logitech to just cheap things out and rebrand various so-called computer speakers as Amazon Basics. Or did they strike a deal with these speaker companies to sell their own version of these sorts of things? Wouldn't be the first time that an ODM agreement was struck with computer speakers either. I mean, Dell actually had dedicated Alltech Lansings at one point that were sold as Dell speakers and whatnot. So this stuff does happen. But hopefully the lessons that we can learn from this original sloppy speaker showdown can help us in our day and age. Because ultimately, it's about total cost of ownership and return on investment. When you buy gear, what are you getting? And what kind of gotchas are you either getting stuck with or finding a way to avoid? This is Multimedia J Radio Style. Don't touch that dial.